We're going to do a new series uh, over the summer on the fruits of the on the fruit singular of the spirit. Interesting, isn't it? Is there anybody here who doesn't need to grow in the fruit of the spirit? Anyone? Excellent. We all need some of this stuff, right? This good stuff. Uh, thank you, Anna, for reading. Brilliant. We've got a contrast going on with the, the works of the flesh and the fruit of the Spirit. Uh, we know all of this stuff. Uh, we, all, we know it so well. If you could put the opening slide up, Jonathan, that would be really great. Thanks. Just uh, by way of introduction, and then we're going to do a little bit of a dive into the first one, which is the paradigm-setting fruit, love. And uh, you think you might know everything about it, but... You don't, and I don't. <laughs> but the fruit of the Spirit. How would you assess yourself this morning? If you could, you know, it's a bit crass, I know, but if you could grade yourself on the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control, on a scale of 1 to 10, where would you place yourself in love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, goodness, self-control? How would you do that? But I know what would be easier for us to do. Turn to your neighbor and you tell them what you think they are doing in those fruits. How's that? No, a bit awkward, right? It's a lot easier, isn't it, though? In a recent interview, I don't know if you saw this, Richard Dawkins, our famous atheist, said that he was a cultural Christian. Oh, how his tune has changed. In the same breath as saying that, he said that although I'm a cultural Christian, I despise Christianity, but I love what Christianity brings to a society, to a culture. Huh? I know, I know. One person responded by saying that he likes the apples of the orchard, but wants to burn down the orchard. It's madness, isn't it? Absolute madness. He likes the fruit, but despises the mechanism, the tools, the method that got the fruit there in the first place. Total contradiction in terms. And let's pray and hope that this world-famous atheist, that his worldview is unraveling at this point. Because it is a confused and contradictory way to see the world. Do we have any slides up there? They've not been put on the computer. No. There you go. I was going to say, it took me a lot of work to get those on there, but here we go. Here we go. No, not that. That's not it. That's, next, that's, um, that's in a few weeks. That's a heading. That's a heading slide. Anyway, leave it. doesn't matter. doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. The fruit of the Spirit in Galatians is placed in this fifth chapter because the Galatian church were going back to the works of the flesh, the works of the law, salvation by works. They were being duped. Paul is writing a really strong letter here to remind them that that is not the way the gospel works in a person's life or in the life of the believer. So in one sense, they may be obvious to us, but they're not. If you read them on a lovely sunny morning with your coffee steaming by your side and the birds tweeting in the branches... They may seem like a dreamy, middle-class ideal where the world is put to rights, but they're not that either. They're not a dreamy, middle-class ideal. They may seem rather sweet and nice, these fruit of the Spirit, but maybe almost meek and mild. How lovely they sound to our ears, but they're not that either. These fruit of the Spirit are what someone has called soul-expanding qualities. Your soul, as diminished by sin as it is, is meant to expand by living out these qualities. Expansion of the soul, outward-looking and expansive. And taken in their fullness and juicy glory... These are the vehicle by which we relate to God and each other. Jesus said it plainly, didn't he, that the, the golden rule is to love, love God and love your neighbor. 
And that is worked out by the display of the fruit of the Spirit. Now, we could all, as I said, grade ourselves as to how we think we're doing right now. Last week, it might have been different. The, the scales will slide depending on where we're at in our stage of life or particular mood or how it's even going for us in terms of our, our, our own inner life, our own spiritual life, or the outward aspect of our relationships with others or even our relationship with God. And some will be stronger and weaker as the weeks and months go by. But if we do claim to follow Christ, the fruit of the Spirit must be evident. They're not an optional extra. They are the evidence of the person who follows Christ. Not all in equal measure, not in some consistent upward trend of ever-increasing glory and perfection and constant growth, not that because we live in the real world, don't we, with anxiety and turmoil and tragedy and trauma and unjust suffering and our own sin and our own weaknesses and our own shadow, we hide behind all the time. And we need this Christ to come in and supernaturally give us the natural thing that we need to live as a human being, to flourish, to live well, to show forth Christ in the world. It's not by my strength that I do this. It's not by your strength that you are a Christian either. It's by the power of God, the Spirit of God in you. And if the Spirit of God is in you, you will bloom like a thousand orchards and demonstrate this glorious fruit and work of the Holy Spirit. Not a salvation of works. It's, it's exactly as Paul said, that Apollos planted, I water, but it's God that gives the growth. God does all the work. God does the saving and the calling and the sanctifying and the sending. He does all of that for us. Now, it is, there is a strange sense of divine irony over this. Um, I don't know whether you've spent several weeks, months, or even years wondering if you're even a Christian. Anyone? Am I, am I alone in this? <laughs> you know, am I really... After that, after I said that, after I did that, am I really a Christian? I mean, over the last three, four, five weeks, I've wondered if I'm a Christian. For various reasons, which I won't go into now. Wouldn't want to uh, let the cat out the bag right now. But it's only when we're faced with certain people, certain contexts, certain situations... Do we become aware of this? And the awareness of it is the work of the Holy Spirit in your life. Drawing out the very thing that you need to pay attention to in your life. What is it that you need to pay attention to in your life right now, as far as God is concerned, that vertical relationship that we have? We talked about, we've talked about unity uh, in the service already this morning. That's all very well and good. But we're not just here to be one happy family, although that would be lovely. We're not here just for that, are we? We're here to proclaim the kingdom of God in all its fullness and all its power, all its strength and might. Nothing less than that. And unity comes in the midst of that, not despite that. Which is really important to get. So one thing we can be assured of is that the more we grow in these fruits, the more aware of your own poverty you are in them. If you think <laughs> you're really good at love, the fruit of love is flourishing in my life, well, rest assured that the history of the church tells us that those who are close to God really don't think that they're loving at all. Or joy or peace, or patience. There's a sense in which the closer you are to God, the more aware of your own, your own sin that you are. And that brings a humility to it, doesn't it? It brings a, a trust in God's saving grace. The closer you get to the God who is love, the more you realize that you're not quite God's gift to the world that you thought you were. The closer you get to the God who is goodness itself, 
the more you realize that you're not quite as good as you thought. And so you press on in the faith, drawing ever closer to God. And that drawing closer, by definition, in the awareness of your own life, is meant to uh, foster that trust and that relationship in Christ who saves. And that's why it's in a book, in a letter that Paul has written to many churches in Galatia, modern-day Turkey, who were going back to a religion of works, a, a hybrid of Judaism and Christianity, but a salvation by works. Later in the Ephesian letter, he would say, Paul would write, it is by grace you've been saved, it is not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. So all of these fruits are necessary for our, our growth, for our good, and for God's glory, for our good, our good. They are necessary for human flourishing. Can you imagine what the world would look like if all, I don't know, roughly 8 billion people, haven't counted them lately, if everyone on the planet was displaying the fruits of the Spirit? What would that look like? Can you even imagine that? I'm not sure I can. And so we need God to supernaturally give us what we need naturally to live our life. That's why it's all gift, and that's why it's all grace. And the very thing that we must have can only be acquired by God's poured out gift. God has to meet us in this life that we live. It's not just, as you know, I, I'm sure most of you know that the Christian faith is relational at its heart. It's why God is Trinity. If God is love, there had to be an object of love a lover and the beloved, which is where the Son comes in, the language that we have for God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And this God is a God who gives, who pours out, and this God must pour out for us the gifts on those who live by faith, as Paul would say earlier in Galatians. I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me, Galatians 2.21. So we need what God alone can give. One of the greatest definitions of love, of course, is, is in the New Testament from 1 Corinthians 13. 1 Corinthians 13 is like a mirror on God's nature and God's character. God is these things, all right? Now, you won't always find them in direct words. It's not going to be talking about these nine fruits of the Spirit in Galatians 1.13, but you will see them played out in the language of that chapter. Which is the most beautiful chapter, isn't it? Read out at most weddings. Anna and Matt, did you have it read out at your four weddings? No, I'm not sure. And so this great list has to start with the one thing that abides here in eternity. At the end of chapter 13 of 1 Corinthians, Paul says, the th these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest is love. Why did he say that? Because when we are in eternity, in glory, we don't need faith, because it will be fulfilled. We don't need hope, because it will be realized. What will there be? Love alone abides because God is love. It's an essential aspect or element of his character. It's who he is. So God is the one who defines this holy love. But we live in a world where intolerant radicals come up with slogans like love is love. And I'll say that again, intolerant radicals come up with slogans like love is love. Without any reference to God who is love, without any reference to holy love as defined by the nature and character of God, 
But love is love is not true. It is a slogan, for example, so popular and embedded in our culture that sounds so nice and so good, but without definition, without borders, it is vacuous of all meaning. It's really important that you try and understand the severity of this because our kids and our grandkids and our great-grandkids and for some of you our great-great-grandkids, no offence, are wrestling with this stuff right now. It is a self-designated term in our culture that has said no to God several hundred years ago. God does not define love. Let's move the Bibles out of our schools. Let's stop praying at our national and local parliament and government levels. Love is love. God has no say in the matter. I beg your pardon. It's another way to say, do whatever you long, like as long as you both love it. What, what sort of chasms of hell does that line of thinking open up in our minds? It is a self-designated term for do whatever you want. G.K. Chesterton, there's a slide for this one, said... The heretic, oh, there's no slides, is there? Sorry. The heretic is a man who loves his truth more than the truth itself. And that's the age we live in. That's the essential kernel of postmodern society. My truth is my truth. Your truth is your truth. Live and let live. Love is love. Just get along without any reference to a holy God. And so the reason why love is first in this list of fruit is this. Because when Adam and Eve went their own way in the Garden of Eden, they disobeyed a holy God. They didn't just make a decision, they disobeyed a holy God. And Genesis 3 tells us that God had said to them that they can take anything in all creation except that one thing over there. Anything except one thing. God had said, do not take anything from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But Adam and Eve did, and by theological implication of original sin, so did we. We took, and that's why we need saving. It's why we need sanctifying. It's why we need rescuing. It's why we need God to pour out his gift of the Spirit so that we can flourish in the fruit of the Spirit, which is the very nature of and character of a holy God. But what does the fall mean? And as I give a brief definition, I want you to think about, do we see this in today's culture, in, especially in the Western world, in the UK, as a Western nation? Do we see this in the world today? What is original sin? Original sin can be described as appropriating to myself the knowledge of good and evil. What does that mean? That means that I decide what's wrong, I decide what's right, I decide what's good, I decide what's bad, appropriating to myself the knowledge of good and evil, which is the theological truth behind Adam and Eve taking from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. I'm the arbiter of good and evil, not God. Okay? That means that I decide what is right and wrong. I decide what is sinful. I decide what is righteous. I decide who's in. I decide who's out. And we have to ask the question, by what standard now is this claim being made over, over our lives? Love is love, right? No. Because without reference to God, love doesn't mean anything at all. The heretic is a man who loves his truth more than truth itself. We see this on our political landscape. We see it on our cultural landscape. We see it in our institutions. The love of my truth more than the truth. If we extend this out into our day and our time now that we live, 
It means I get to decide my gender, and it would be unloving for you to stop me as a man from becoming a woman or a boy from becoming a girl. Where it's almost now reaching such hysterical levels that it's almost fashionable to promote this stuff appropriating the knowledge of good and evil to myself, where I am the standard. And I'm not making this up, but extended into some and maybe even ever-increasing schools, they are placing litter trays for those children that identify as cats, appropriating to myself the knowledge of good and evil. This is where it ends up. And it's unloving to say you're not a cat, but here's a litter tray, so we don't offend you. Well, it is offensive to a holy God. I wish I was joking. And when we do this, appropriating to myself the knowledge of good and evil, without God, it is a salvation by works, it is a righteousness by works, it is precisely the reason why we have these amazing six chapters in Galatians. Read it later this afternoon. Feel the full force of Paul, who said, a plague on all your houses if you follow this pathway. And now in modern 21st century Britain and the West, we're living with God giving us over to our sin. And we see madness and chaos everywhere. To know what love is, we must know who God is. God is the controlling and defining factor in all of this. And if you look at the, if you remember the list before we got to the fruit of the Spirit, we looked at the fruit of the flesh that Anna read out. We can see these in all of the headlines around the world, our newspapers, our TV, the internet, every, every news outlet is covering every single one of these um, fruits of the flesh. In that list, we see those who appropriate to themselves the knowledge of good and evil. In that list, we see the world does not know a holy God and so does not know what holy love is. Holy love. That pure love from God's heart that said, they need rescuing and redeeming and saving. And Jesus said, I'll go, Father, I'll go. I'll go to them. I will make my dwelling among them. I will rescue them. Verse 24 says, But those who belong to Jesus Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. And so our life is one long crucifixion. One long crucifixion. One of the reasons I say that the fruits are relational, sacramentally relational, sacrificially relational, is based on what some medieval theologians have defined love as. Love, they said, is willing the good of the other. Not a satisfaction of my own personal needs, but love that wills. I only love you when I will your good. And you only love me when you will my good in relationship. Willing the good of the other, right? It is relational and sacrificial. Uh, one of my favorite films, I'm sure that there are one or two people here who are also film buffs. I love the film Face Off. Anyone? With John Travolta and Nicolas Cage. Super cop and super baddie and... Uh, for some strange reason, they have to swap faces so that the super cop can get the... Anyway, it doesn't matter. John Travolta is the super cop at this point, and he's just had the idea that while the baddie is under, in a coma, if they swap his face and the, good cop, and the cop goes into the prison, he can infiltrate the gang, get the information they need to stop the bomb going off in the city. So they propose this to this super cop, John Travolta, and he says... Thinking of love, willing the good of the other. He says, okay, what are you asking me to do? Let's see. You're asking me to break the law, risk my life, 
put in the dark all the people that love me and all the people that trust me. Okay, I'll do it, he said. Love willing the good of the other at great risk, at great cost. I like this contemporary definition of love. Love is friendship set on fire. Do you like that? If God loves you, he wants a friendship that is like burning fire. Well, fire is burning. That's a tautology. I don't want to do that. It's like he is so passionate for you and the world to redeem it. He wants friendship with you, with us. Friendship on fire. Yes. So biblical holy love is the God who is love, who's drawing us into this radical, transforming holy love. There's so much more that can be said, but I hope I've been reasonably clear this morning. I want to finish with this. I said that all of the fruits are relational. And they are formed in the crucible of community, which is what the church is, where we see each other's virtues and we see each other's vices. We see your strengths and we see your weaknesses. You don't have to worry about that at all. We see your weaknesses as clear as day. Amen? Anyone see my weaknesses? Anyone? But it's in this way that we sharpen each other. As iron sharpens iron, as the proverb says. Iron sharpening iron is how we live this unified life together. This means it's costly, not financially necessarily, but including finances. It's costly to us because God calls us as individuals to be part of a church. He calls the singular to be part of the community. He calls the one to be part of the many. And this is the idea of the one, me, and the many, us. That's why God is Trinity. That's why God is defined as God is love. One God, the one, and the many, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So we're reflecting God's character in this way. It was the one Christ who died for the many. And that's where God's love can be most clearly seen, church. In Christ crucified is the only way, the best way to see the love of God. Where Christ is appropriating to himself the sins of the whole world in sacrificial, holy, and redeeming love. Reversing that curse of Genesis 3 and healing humanity of its sin sickness. That's what he's doing. A few years I read a, a book about parish ministry uh, by an American writer called Richard Lisher, and he tells the story of Flannery O'Connor, who recounts this story of a little girl who loves to visit the convent and the sisters there. And every time the nun gives her that hug of greeting for this little girl, the crucifix which hung around the sister's waist got mashed into the child's face. And he says, in this way, love always leaves its mark. I love that image of the mark of the crucifix in that gesture of embrace and love between the little girl and the nun. So I pray, let Christ leave his mark on you today, church. And may you be nourished by the very being of God, by the glory of his word, and by the power of his Holy Spirit. Lord, we need you to meet with us afresh this day. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you, church.